Susan Marie Nager Smith was born December 30, 1969, to parents Marilyn and Kent Nager Smith of Carmel, New York. A cheerleader and competitive skier, she was known for her friendly and outgoing personality and as someone with lots of friends who enjoyed having fun. In 1990, at the age of 20, she had just finished her sophomore year at Westchester Community College where she was majoring in marketing and made plans to go with five close friends to celebrate Memorial Day weekend in the shore town of Wildwood, New Jersey. The girls arrived in Wildwood around 1.30 a.m. on Saturday and rented a room at the Sonata Motel. They had some alcohol and marijuana, and Susan decided to leave the room about 9 p.m. and venture out by herself to see if anything exciting was going on in the area. Since Susan was only 20, she couldn't legally drink at any of the bars that lined the streets of Wildwood. Those streets were filled with thousands of young adults who had come to the shore for the holiday weekend, and there were dozens of house parties in the area as well. With many of them spilling over into the streets, it didn't take long for Susan to find one that looked inviting and she began partying with strangers. At some point during the evening, Susan ended up at a party at the JoJo Apartments on Maple Avenue, about five blocks away from the motel where she was staying. By the time she got there, she had already consumed a lot of alcohol and was clearly intoxicated. She was seen throwing up at least once, and witnesses recalled that she was having trouble standing. She was offered a ride back to her motel by at least one person who was concerned about her, but she declined. The next morning, May 27, 1990, her partially clothed body was found near dumpsters behind Schellinger's, a restaurant located just two blocks from one of the busiest sections of the boardwalk where she was seen hours earlier. There was a bloody handprint on her chest and blood on her t-shirt, which along with her bra, was pushed up around her neck. There was also blood found on other parts of her body, and she reportedly had a skull fracture. Her jeans were pulled down and twisted around her left ankle and her tennis shoes were missing and her feet were clean, showing she hadn't walked without her shoes on. A witness would eventually come forward with information. This witness was a 20-year-old man who was visiting the shore from Philadelphia that had left the apartments around 2 a.m. with her. He later told police that he had attempted to escort her back to her hotel, but she was so drunk that she couldn't recall the name of her hotel or where it was located. The man, who admitted that he had been drinking heavily as well, stated that he eventually gave up on Susan and went back to his own room. It was about 2.30 a.m. when he last saw her, leaning against the wall of Schellinger's restaurant on Atlantic Avenue at the time. He said she was so intoxicated that she would have been incapable of consenting to sex. A toxicology report showed her blood alcohol content was 0.285. While this witness was one of the last people to see her alive, he was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. Detectives eventually managed to locate and interview a total of 107 people who had seen or spoken to Susan on the night in question. They administered polygraph examinations to 17 people, but all of them were eventually cleared of any involvement in Susan's death. Initially, her death was covered up and classified as accidental due to alcohol intoxication and exposure. It said that it was ruled accidental because the town wanted to protect terrorism, and it's also said that the medical examiner, Dr. John Napoleon, was incompetent and unqualified for the job. They told the public that she was drunk and she had consensual sex behind the restaurant and afterward she was too drunk to get up and she froze to death in 57 degree weather. Dr. Napoleon's conclusion was that Susan's cause of death was lethal cardiac arrhythmia and hypothermia due to alcoholic intoxication and exposure. However, he explained away all the bruises on her body by claiming she had likely injured herself by falling down due to her level of intoxication. This lit a fire under her angry parents and local residents as well. Police could no longer conduct a homicide investigation despite the fact that many of them believed Susan had been murdered. A Sea Isle City resident named Terry Downey joined Susan's parents to attest the accidental ruling. She's also made a name for herself in Cape May County by questioning investigations into the deaths of several other women that occurred in recent years. 
Susan's parents hired attorneys and private investigators and fought a legal battle. Susan's father, Mr. Negger Smith, also sought a second and third opinion from forensic pathologists who both reached the same conclusion, Susan was a homicide victim. The fight for justice had continued for three long years when a new prosecutor, Steve Moore, became the new Cape May County District Attorney. After reading the Negger Smith's file, Moore reached the same conclusion as Susan's family. He lobbied state law enforcement officials, and an extensive review by the state police led them to the same finding, homicide. After a three-year battle, her cause of death was changed to homicide after a world-renowned forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Baden, viewed autopsy photos and listed 26 points of trauma on Susan's body. But still, the original medical examiner refused to change her death certificate. It wasn't until 1995 when a new coroner, Dr. Elliot Gross, was appointed coroner and agreed to take another look at Susan's death. Dr. Gross examined Susan's larynx, which had been preserved, and found that it had fractures consistent with manual strangulation. In October 1995, the cause of death on Susan's death certificate was finally changed to homicide. An autopsy determined that she was sexually assaulted before her death and DNA from the assault was preserved. A profile was later created from the DNA and in 2018, the Major Crimes Unit started a genetic genealogy analysis of the unknown DNA profile. Using genetic genealogy, genealogists and investigators were able to narrow it down to 62-year-old Jerry Rosado. Rosado then provided a buccal swab on May 26, 2021, exactly 31 years after the attack, to officially verify the match. He was later arrested 32 years after the murder, but has only been charged with second-degree crime of sexual assault. No murder charges have been filed in the case, but authorities say further charges could be made should additional information become available. He now faces five to 10 years if convicted of the sexual assault. Twenty-two-year-old Christine McWhorter and her aunt, 31-year-old Beatrice Daniels, were originally from the Philadelphia area of Pennsylvania and moved to Mount Union, Pennsylvania to get away from the city violence. The women lived in the Chestnut Terrace housing complex with Christine's four-month-old daughter and four-year-old son in Mount Union. Neighbors would report that on January 3, 2009, they heard yelling and commotion in the early morning hours. Later that same morning, Christine's four-year-old son was able to finally get a neighbor's attention. That's when it was discovered that both women were found lying in their bed, shot to death. It's unknown how long the children were left alone with the bodies, but it's believed the murders occurred sometime between 9 p.m. on January 2nd and noon on January 3rd, which is when the four-year-old got the attention of a neighbor. Droplets of blood were taken into evidence from the scene, and the initial DNA report concluded that the blood collected from the stairs and interior doors of the apartment were all deposited by an unidentified male. Seven years later, on March 14, 2016, Trooper David Clemens submitted DNA samples to DNA Solutions, which in turn prepared and forwarded the samples to Parabon Nanolabs. Parabon performed phenotyping on a blood sample, which narrowed the suspect down to a medium to light-skinned African-American male with green or hazel eyes and little to no freckles. On July 12, 2018, Parabon conducted a genetic genealogy analysis of the DNA recovered from the murder scene. Three months later, they provided a report on the genetic genealogy of the DNA and identified Mariko Tyrone Johnson as a potential match. Johnson was interviewed over a year later at his home in Newport News, Virginia. He told investigators that he knew Christine through his then-girlfriend, Cynthia Swan, whom he dated from 2001 until 2012. The women were close friends, but Johnson denied having ever entered Christine's apartment. He provided his DNA to detectives, which was sent off to the state police lab in December 2019. The lab reported Johnson's DNA matched the blood evidence found on the stairs and interior doors of the crime scene. 
Investigators then compared Johnson's time card to the estimated time of the double murder. The complaint says that on January 22, 2020, state police received time cards from Johnson's then employer, the New York Department of Corrections, which confirmed he was off of work on January 2, 2009 and started his January 3rd shift at 7 a.m. Police estimate the time it takes to travel the 294 miles between Mount Union and Johnson's then workplace is 4 hours and 43 minutes. Police checked to see if Johnson had access to a 25 caliber firearm, the type used to kill Christine and Beatrice. His half-brother told troopers that he thought his late father owned a 25 caliber handgun and that Johnson inherited their father's belongings when he passed away in 1998. Johnson was then arrested on May 24, 2022 and charged with two counts of criminal homicide 13 years after the double murder. Investigators interviewed Johnson's ex-girlfriend, Cynthia, and learned that she was originally supposed to travel with Christine from Philadelphia to Mount Union on January 1, 2009 and stay for the weekend, but decided at the last minute to remain in Philadelphia with a man, Benjamin June. Cynthia told the troopers it was around this time that Johnson found out that Cynthia was having an affair with June. Police say the last incoming text on Christine's cell phone was from Cynthia, asking Christine to call her and it was important, but she never responded to the text. Johnson remains behind bars with an upcoming trial, but has spent the last 13 years enjoying his freedom. Kara Nancy Nichols was born on May 20, 1993, to parents Julia and Paul Nichols. She grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, with an older brother and a younger sister. During her sophomore year of high school, Kara fell into depression when her family dog died. Her parents tried to get her to go to counseling, but Kara refused and didn't take her prescribed medication. Instead, Kara started using drugs and became rebellious and manic and was most likely struggling with an untreated mental illness. She attended Rampart High School in Colorado Springs and later graduated from local alternative high school, Life Skills of Colorado Springs, where she could work at her own pace. After graduation, Kara began waitressing and modeling part-time, mostly lingerie shoots. She also created a profile on Model Mayhem, an online modeling website that links models with photographers. In the summer of 2012, Kara quit her job and moved with her family to Chicago, Illinois. Her drug abuse worsened, and her family enrolled her in a drug treatment program, but she was discharged early when she didn't follow the rules. In August of 2012, Kara moved back to Colorado Springs on her own. She lived in a home with three male roommates in the 6700 block of Mission Road in the Cimarron Hills area of Colorado Springs. A couple months later, on October 9, 2012, she told her roommate that she would be traveling from Colorado Springs to Denver for a photo shoot job. When she left, she was picked up by someone in a dark sedan. Her brother Terrence last spoke to her at almost midnight that night, and she said she was on her way to Denver for a modeling assignment. Two days later, Kara's parents reported her missing when she didn't return. On November 30th, 2012, a profile featuring photos of Kara appeared on My Red Book, which is an online Las Vegas escort website. When police called the number, her family said the voice was not hers. Authorities eventually concluded that the photos were taken from another source and that Kara was not in Las Vegas, and escort websites often use random pictures lifted from the internet to advertise online. Months later, Police learned she had actually been working as an escort and had placed an ad wearing lingerie on a classified ad website at 7.28 p.m. the night she disappeared. Kara's cell phone records revealed she made eight calls on October 9, 2012, between 9.58 p.m. and 11.08 p.m., and that she last used her phone at 11.59 p.m. On May 8, 2013, the detective finally received a return call from a man who identified himself as Joel Hollendorfer. When asked if the phone belonged to Hollendorfer, he said yes. 
The detective said he was investigating a missing person case and his number was on the list of records from the night she disappeared. Hollendorfer said he was seeking escort services that night and answered Kara's ad, saying they spoke several times that night, but he was looking to go to her, but she only went two locations. Hollendorfer went on to say that they never met that night. Investigations volunteer Mark Oldfield was able to track Kara's phone movements the night of October 9th to its last known usage in the early hours of October 10th, 2012. Mark was able to determine that Kara left her house at approximately 11.16 p.m. and traveled the route that led directly toward Burgess Road, where Hollendorfer's family owned a farm. Further details revealed six calls and texts were sent and received from 11.34 p.m. to 11.41 p.m. coming off Woodsman Tower. Based on Kara's phone activity, her phone was at the intersection of Woodman and Black Forest Road at 11.33 p.m. Based on the last known activity from Kara's phone, it led them to 9665 Burgess Road. Detective Gugliotta obtained a search warrant for the address on October 2, 2014, a year after she went missing. Multiple agencies participated in the search, including cadaver dogs. Hollendorfer's mother, Betty, walked the property with members from the search team and pointed out numerous locations where animals may be buried since purchasing the property in 1985. Cadaver dogs were brought to the property and ground-penetrating radar was used to determine spots that had been disturbed, but instead of excavating the spots, they did what Betty suggested. They searched the property across the street at 11,660 Green Acres Lane, which her son also had access to. Cadaver dogs narrowed in on a shallow grave, which was excavated, and it was apparent that roots were dug up at the site, and a hole had been dug to about the size of a human body, but no human remains were found. For reasons that are not explained in the affidavit, none of the other areas the dogs hit on were excavated, leading to the question, why bring cadaver dogs to a property and not dig when they hit on certain areas? Turns out, Betty was protecting her son, and if they would have excavated the areas across the street that the dogs hit on, they would have found what they were looking for. During an interview that same month, Hollendorfer admitted to looking up Kara online, wanting to meet her, and communicating with her. He said Kara never met him at the location that she was supposed to, and he never ended up meeting her. He added that he had been heavily involved with escorts and drugs, which he says is why his marriage ended. During the initial investigation, Detective Gugliotta attempted to reach Hollendorfer's wife, Christina, but she wouldn't cooperate with the initial investigation and never made a statement. However, on February 1, 2022, 10 years after Kara's disappearance, FBI special agents interviewed Christina. Turns out, she had been keeping a huge secret for eight years until investigators tracked her down to Virginia and knocked on her door. Now known as Christina Palmer, she stated that after Hollendorfer's father died in November 2014, he admitted to her that he accidentally killed an escort he hired and buried her body on top of an old horse grave on his parents' property. During the interview, Christina stated that Hollendorfer said that he accidentally strangled Kara to death and then buried her on an old horse grave with plastic bags and lime. She also told detectives that Hollendorfer said he told his parents what he did and that he believed it had driven his father to his grave. Based on the information she provided, on February 7, 2022, a search warrant was obtained and a team of El Paso County Sheriff's Office detectives and specialists alongside the FBI evidence response team were deployed to the 9600 block of Burgess Road. Police zeroed in on a spot where his mother said her favorite horse, Milo, was buried. Three feet down, they found a garbage bag, a human hand, and more remains. Hollendorfer was then arrested days later on charges of second-degree murder and tampering with physical evidence, ending a 10-year mystery that could have ended nine years earlier. During a court appearance on February 17, 2022, Hollendorfer's charge was upgraded from second to first-degree murder and his bond was revoked based on the autopsy results. 
Kara's family has long maintained that the El Paso County Sheriff's Department botched the initial investigation and the Sheriff, Terry Maqueda, was run out of office amid allegations of misconduct in 2014. Some describe Maqueda's term in Colorado Springs as similar to living in the Wild West. Many describe former Sheriff Maqueda as very corrupt. He allegedly led an incredibly corrupt department and was involved with multiple women in the department, giving them lavish raises and spending department funds on romantic vacations with them. He would also allegedly punish or fire the women who wouldn't sleep with him. He also allegedly had a hit list of people he intended to kill. At the same time, one officer was running an extensive Ponzi scheme in the department. David Hawkins had collected around $300,000 in cash from fellow deputies and even their families, but never invested it and was eventually convicted and sent to prison. The allegations against Maqueda were already years old at that point, but he couldn't be forced to resign because of some technicality. Maqueda also mismanaged the investigation into the devastating Black Forest fire. In the summer of 2021, less than a year before Kara's body was discovered, several local area residents became concerned about the condition of two horses on the Hollendorfer's property, Meadow View Farm. The El Paso County Sheriff's Office investigated and had a veterinarian and a horse rescue come to the site. Unfortunately, both horses had to be euthanized because they were so starved they could not be saved. It's unclear what, if any, charges were filed against the Hollendorfers. I'm sure they were likely more concerned about law enforcement being so close to Kara's grave at the time. Her parents were in disbelief two years after their daughter went missing over a recording released by the El Paso County Sheriff's Office that suggests the initial investigator brushed off the case. In the 50-minute recording, patrol deputy Cliff Porter is confronted by his superiors about statements he made in Kara's case. Porter was taken off the case after a couple of months, but he came under fire after statements he made to his replacement were reported to his superiors. He repeated those statements in a meeting as well. This is what he said. I said, you know, maybe somebody would finally just say, look, this is a cold case. This girl is probably dead. We're going to work the leads, but we're going to shelve this thing. We won't overreact every time Mr. Nichols comes in. Kara's mother stated that in the first few weeks, they were wondering why Officer Porter wouldn't respond to their calls. And when he did, he seemed very cynical, very negative about the possibility of finding their daughter alive. She stated, you just wonder what else has gone on. You wonder how many other victims have been treated like this. It just re-victimized a family who's already suffering. Thirty-four-year-old Rita Gutierrez Garcia was born April 7, 1983, and was described as an attentive and compassionate mother of her three boys. On March 17, 2018, she went out with friends to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. After spending time at the Speakeasy and Breakers Grill on Main Street in Longmont, Colorado, she and friends went through the alleyway to the parking lot behind Three's Bar to leave. Rita was on the phone with someone at 2.30 a.m. when she told her friends she was getting a ride with someone else, and so they left. Sadly, this is the last time they would see her alive. Later, her mom arrived at Rita's home on Sunday to take her 18, 13, and 9-year-old grandsons to church. That's when the grandmother learned her daughter was missing, and after an exhaustive search for her, they reported her missing the following day. Early on in the investigation, Juan Figueroa was identified as a possible suspect in her disappearance. Several witnesses also reported that he had interacted with Rita inside the bar about 1.30 a.m. and was seen outside the bar near her about an hour later. A security camera captured Figueroa's truck traveling through that exact same area at 3.03 a.m. Cell phone data from Rita's phone placed her phone near the 600 block between Main Street and Kaufman Street between 2.40 a.m. to 3.03 a.m. on the morning she was last seen. Four minutes later, two 911 call hang-ups were made from Rita's phone. 
Her phone dropped off the network at 3.10 a.m. and was in the area of 3rd Avenue and Vivian Street in Longmont at that time. Rita was missing and evidence pointed to one person responsible for her disappearance and that was Figueroa. Figueroa left Colorado two days after Rita went missing after police attempted to contact him at his mother's home in regards to her disappearance. He was briefly in Texas, but later crossed the border into Mexico. While in Mexico, he asked several people for money and said he was in trouble and that he planned to sell his truck. He tried to re-enter the U.S. and was arrested on March 27, 2018 on a warrant for a separate sexual assault and attempted murder of a woman a year earlier for which he was later convicted and sentenced to 93 years to life. While behind bars, he told a cellmate that he strangled the missing woman and disposed of her body before returning to his sister's house. He also told that cellmate, according to the indictment, that she had called him a weirdo, which caused him to punch her, knocking her unconscious. After that, he strangled her to death. Prosecutors presented their case to a grand jury in April 2021 as a no-body homicide as DNA evidence and cell phone data linked him to her presumed murder. Two months later, the grand jury indicted him for first-degree murder and kidnapping in Rita's case. In court, he admitted to knocking her unconscious, dragging her to his vehicle, and strangling her. He said he believed he was insane that night and snapped when she called him a weirdo. As part of a plea deal, Figueroa led investigators to the location of Rita's body. She was recovered in an area of northern Colorado's Weld County on April 28, 2022. Figueroa pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and first-degree kidnapping. He was immediately sentenced to 48 years in prison. The sentences will be served concurrently along with the 93-year sentence he's already serving for the unrelated case of kidnapping and attempted murder of another victim. Clifford Bernhardt served his country as an Army Sergeant in the Vietnam War and was ultimately awarded a Purple Heart. After serving in the Army, he began working as a construction worker. On June 7, 1969, he would marry his high school sweetheart, Linda Reich. The couple was very much in love and very well liked by all that knew them. On November 6, 1973, the 24-year-olds were still settling into their new ranch-style home at 1116 Dorothy Lane near the Yellowstone River in Billings, Montana. They had planned to go have dinner at Linda's parents' house around the corner, but they decided to cancel. Linda called her mother, June Reich, and told her they planned on staying in for the night instead. The two enjoyed a hamburger casserole that Linda had whipped up for them. The next morning, when Linda didn't show up for work, her mother went to check on the couple and came upon a horrifying scene. She found the couple tragically and brutally murdered. Cliff was found lying face down in the master bedroom with a severe wound to his head. Cliff and Linda had both been strangled to death and Linda had been sexually assaulted and left naked on the floor of another bedroom. There were also signs that both were bound at the wrist and ankles at some point. Strangely and possibly from the shock of it all, while waiting for law enforcement to arrive, Linda's mother cleaned up the dishes which disturbed the crime scene. She stated that it appeared to her that before doing the dishes that the table may have been set for three people. The killer had opened up windows in both bedrooms the bodies were found in and turned the furnace down all the way. The lowest temperature that night was 6 degrees, making it cold enough for a bowl of ice cubes found next to Linda's body to remain frozen. It's unknown what the bowl of ice next to her body was for, but possibly used during the sexual assault. Missing from the house was all of Linda's panties, some of her shoes, and her green suitcase. With no signs of forced entry, investigators speculated that they knew their killer and had willingly let them in. Also, the murder may have been premeditated as he brought his own leather bindings. The crime devastated the Bernhardt and Reich families and left a void in the lives of all who knew Linda and Clifford. Over many years, about 80 DNA samples were collected from persons of interest, but none were a match. 
In 2004, there was a huge break in the case when DNA was discovered on Linda's purple pants. It was entered into CODIS, but there was no matches. Then in 2012, a cold case unit became obsessed with finding the killer, and the following year, an anonymous donor offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to a conviction. In 2015, the county hired Parabon to analyze the DNA and created a composite predicting the suspect's ethnicity, hair, and eye color and complexion. A few years later, in 2018, when forensic genetic genealogy was fully blossoming, genealogists were working tirelessly to pinpoint who the DNA belonged to. Finally, on January 3, 2019, Parabon determined the suspect was one of two brothers. Unfortunately, one of those brothers had died, and so investigators obtained DNA from the one living and were able to rule him out which means the DNA could only belong to one individual. 45 years after Linda and Cliff's deaths, authorities announced the suspect, Cecil Stan Caldwell, a former co-worker of Linda's at a grocery store warehouse. Linda worked in billing and secretarial work, while Caldwell worked in the warehouse and meat department. He was also a father of two adopted children and two stepchildren and had no criminal history. Unfortunately, in 2003, he died in Billings at the age of 59 and never faced justice. Caldwell had no arrest record, and authorities likely will never know the true motive for the slayings. Former Deputy Dean Mellum, who worked on the case in 1973, said he hopes the news will at least give some comfort to the couple's families.